Um, so today is about um, authorship, um, and it's specifically about um, how you situate yourself as an artist, as a scholar, in the work you do, and in, specifically in acts of citizenship. Uh, and that's why we asked uh, Rick here today for the morning, and in the afternoon you'll have a talk with, uh, or Quincy will do a spoken word workshop with you. But this morning, um, Rick is going to be talking about um, artist resistance. Is that a... Yeah. But it's, a, it's very simplified, of course. Um, but also, um, he uh, considers himself an um, activist philosopher. Is that, and uh, so that's why it's very interesting to talk to Rick about art as a form of resistance, but also as how he positions himself in and towards his work, what he does. Um, same setup as yesterday. Feel free to ask questions in between. And I hope you enjoy it. Welcome. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> uh, thanks for asking me. Um, yeah, I have a background in philosophy and art theory, so uh, I'm very happy to be part of this. Uh, although I will really do a philosophy talk today because I think it would be a nice addition to the program. In the end, we will talk about specific artworks, artwork. And we'll see if it works or if we have something to deal with. Um, but uh, well, yeah, in the meantime, of course, you're free to uh, jump in and ask questions. It makes no sense at all. Um, yeah, I was asked to give a talk, which is mainly uh, coming from the fact that I uh, co-edited this book. It's called. Uh, this Deleuzean Century, and the subtitle is Art, Activism, Life. It's edited by Rosie and myself. Uh, came out uh, recently. Um, I have a chapter in it, of course, um, which is called, <laughs> <laughs> let me check. <laughs> the Revelation of a World That Was Always Already There. And then the subtitle is The Creative Act as an, op as an Occupation. So that's what I'm going to talk about today. Um, in the book I use a lot of Deleuze and I use a lot of Spinoza. I found out yesterday when I was preparing this that I will not talk that much about them, but please feel free to, uh, to see connections because although the names will not drop too often, uh, my talk is 100% Deleuzean uh, and 100% Spinozist. So uh, there's no, there's not a moment where I go in a different direction. By the way, this also means that Deleuze is completely Spinozist. Uh, but well, I guess you would. Well, that, that's not a very surprising conclusion. Um, so to start with. Um, I've, I've figured that it would be nice to have a kind of a motto. Um, let's try to understand how art works and how we can play a role in it. It's a very uh, modest motto in terms of us as artists, um, which has a very long philosophical explanation, I won't make it too long. Uh, I'm not a phenomenologist. A phenomenologist would be interested in rethinking the relation between art, uh, the artwork, and the artist as a kind of a triangle. And uh, a phenom phenomenologist would use these 90 minutes to rethink this triangle, what's the role that we as an artist play, what's the role that the artwork plays, what is art, as a kind of a huge metaphysical question. I'm not going to go in that direction. I, would, I am very much interested in art. Uh, art would be a very vague concept. Uh, that's why I use, uh, prefer to use actually the idea of the creative act. Uh, because to me, uh, uh, art would be a bit too um, vulnerable for very strict metaphysical explanations. So 
no very transcendental idea of what is art. So that's why I prefer to think of the creative act as an activity. Um, not so much as something that we as artists create. Uh, the creative act would be something that we play a role in. And that's why I use this idea. Huh? Let's understand how art works. Also, again, a very practical and a very active way of thinking art. And how we can play a role in it. We don't have to. Uh, we can play a role in it. But how to play a role in it? That's the main question. So, in order to uh, think about us and how to play a role in it, uh, it would be important to, um, to start thinking about what it is to have an idea. Uh, at what moment do we consider something to be an idea? It's a Again, already a very philosophical question, of course. We don't often have ideas. Only rarely we have ideas. And we know that we have one. It's all of a sudden we feel very enthusiastic about something, or we, we see something which we haven't seen before. But it has to do with a, with a moment of thinking, of course. But this thinking, I would say, is not so much limited to ourselves. It is a kind of... Uh, in the end, I would use the concept of occupation. It's a kind of rethinking of something else that was already going on, and we play a role in it. For me to think, thinking, uh, I, I often come back to uh, the work of uh, Gregory Bateson, anthropologist. He had a very... Uh, nice and very um, revolutionary book which was called Steps to an Ecology of Mind already in 1972 <coughs> and he has this very uh, nice explanation very simple it's American philosophers uh, American anthropologists they can sometimes they, they hit the spot by explaining something very simple so how does thinking work? How does an idea work? He, plan he explains it as follows. The same one there. Consider a man felling a tree with an axe. Each stroke of the axe is modified or corrected according to the shape of the cut face of the tree left by the previous stroke. This self-corrective, it asked, mental process is brought about by a total system, tree, eyes, brain, muscles, axe, stroke, tree. And it is this total system that has the characteris characteristics of, and in this crucial concept, immanent mind. So a mind is not something which is located inside of our head, which all of a sudden has an idea. A mind, or thinking, is a process. It is at work. And which means that it is, what Gregory Bateson would call, an ecology of mind. Yes? Yes, imminent is a important word, so it's good that you point that out. Imminent would be the opposite of transcendent. Transcendent would mean the whole idea of a mind is a kind of an elevated thing. If you read René Descartes, he would say thinking starts with the mind, with the fact that you doubt. I think, therefore I am. I am in doubt, therefore I am. And this doubting takes place only in the mind. And the mind is then kind of an elevated thing which hovers above your head, in which ideas pop up about the world and then you project them on the world. So I have an idea about something, let's do it. That's René Descartes. 
Now, that's a transcendent idea of the mind, very old, actually. It's very Christian, it's very Platonist. It really has to do with the kind of a in philosophy they call this a dualism. There's the material world, which is okay, and we have to deal with it. Memento mori, remember that you will die sometimes and then you will come to a more important world. And this world is a kind of spiritual world or elevated world or a world out there. And this world out there, that's where the real stuff happens. That's also where thinking happens. Thinking is something that happens out there. And it is from this uh, yeah, transcendental experience that you judge a reality, and a reality that can be a material reality. So immanent is opposed to transcendent. How would you define it though? Immanent, how would you define that word? Uh, immanent comes from the Latin uh, manus, hand. So at hand, here and now. Very practical, very much situated in the realities that we are confronted with. In manner, in hand. So it's not transcendent. Trans means eh, you're kind of up in the air. Imminent means it's here. Everything takes place in the here and now. So imminence, uh, coming from an imminent perspective, you would also immediately say that there's no such thing as a kind of spiritual world which hovers above us and which is separated from our world. I'm okay with the idea of spirituality as long as you don't cut the wire, as long as you will always say it's part of the here and now. It's a reflection of whatever. So what is imminent mind? Imminent mind is really about the act of thinking, the act of having an idea. And this um, it's difficult to sell this to uh, to even to the people at the Eithof, uh, the people working on uh, neurotransmitters or something like that. They do very practical research on how the brain works and how we have ideas, but in the end they believe that we have a mind and a mind is something which hovers above us. The whole idea of an imminent mind, of a mind that is being created in the here and now, in relation to Many of these developments, I think this is a very nice lineup. Tree, eyes, brain, muscle, X, stroke, tree. And we go back again. But that, that's how thinking works. And that's how. Uh, and that is why um, uh, Gregory Bateson is interested in thinking about the ecology of mind. The ecology of mind is then not so much about oh, how beautiful these green trees and all that. An ecology of mind means that thinking is in itself an ecology. That every idea is not so much, to bring it back to your practice, every idea is not so much born inside the head of an artist, but is, it is a kind of network which is at work and which changes and we change, of course. Yeah. We see that the tree has a different shape, so we should cut it a bit from that angle. But the tree itself also changes. So it's not us just being kind of the active force and the rest of the world being passive and waiting for us to do something. They're all active forces. All of these uh, concepts are active forces. The eyes are active forces, of course, brain to muscles. The X2 is an active force. It has a kind of individuality. It has a program, an idea, maybe. So, ecology of mind. I like to think um, in terms of ecologies when it comes to ideas. But in the end, I think this is also very valuable when we start thinking about how art works and how we play a role in it. 
as said, I don't believe that there's some kind of moment of inspiration in the artist which is separated from the material world. I think it is in the relation to many material artifacts, in relation to everything that takes place in the event, that an idea, some kind of inspiration, can happen. But it is only in this relation. A painter like Francis Bacon called this the accident. He said the accident has to happen. And what did he mean by the accident? He said, as a painter, I'm <coughs> you, you all know what the studio of Francis Bacon looked like. An enormous amount of mess. <laughs> piles of rubbish and then in the middle there was this guy with a painting in front of him and he was uh, well, doing some painting and there was nothing going on at the moment it was not, not, not a moment of creating art or something there was a constant feedback he had to have all this mess, he had to look at pictures he had to uh, feel the paint uh, it was a process. It was very much a process like this one. But what had to happen? What had to happen before some kind of artwork emerged? Well, Francis Bacon called that the accident had to happen. And the accident would mean that all of a sudden there would be a stroke or uh, some powerful movement. It could come from him, it could come from the environment, it could come from a picture that he saw that kind of had a strange effect or new light from the sun coming in. The accident had to happen. And the accident is, is of course always something unforeseen. It is not as if there is a moment where you think, okay, here we go, here we go, there comes the artwork. Mm -hmm. It's always an unforeseen moment. Something which is kind of goes wrong in many ways. So when, to link this to art, I um, am interested in uh, what I called in this chapter uh, the revelation of another world. And the interesting thing is, to quote the entire title again, uh, the revelation of a world that was always already there. Because that is also what Francis Bacon does. And that is also what any idea does. It is a kind of a reshuffling of things. All of a sudden you give rise to something which was always already there, but which we just didn't see before. We didn't experience it. It's a twist, it's an accident. The thing is with an accident, it's not something new coming in. It is the moment, the event, where things go in a different direction as planned, but the direction was there. It's just a realization of something unforeseen. Now, I uh, like to uh, link this to the work of the Leuze. I have to mention his name at least once. <laughs> to the work of Deleuze, but also to many of the artists that he was inspired by, but I mean, these are not your local French painters. These are kind of the heroes of 20th century art, I guess. So it will be interesting to find out how they work. How do they work? How are they caught up in art? How would they consider themselves a part of art? How can they interfere? Now a quote I like very much is this one by Samuel Beckett, who was a big fan of uh, Marcel Proust. Wrote a very good book on it, actually. actually 
read it from here. Yeah. And when he talks about Proust, Beckett has a very nice way of showing us uh, how Marcel Proust was kind of involved in the event, was interested in surfacing uh, a new type of language that we didn't know before. How did he do that? For Proust, the quality of language is more important than any system of ethics or aesthetics. Quality of language is important. Indeed, he makes no attempt to dissociate form from content. The one is a concretion of the other, the revelation of a world. So it's the playing with language that Proust is interested in. The same way that Francis Bacon is interested in playing with lines and colors. And what has to happen? The accident has to happen. What has to happen for Proust? The revelation of a world. The revelation of a world that is always already there. So to um, to conceptualize, well, it's a bit of a strange mix-up, but to conceptualize this, I use the word to occupy, and this is uh, a word that Deleuze used on a few occasions. I think it's very important. And I think it's crucial to understanding uh, how art works. So for me, it's a very valuable concept. I think what uh, I'd like it to mean, and I'm a philosopher, so I'm able to do that. <laughs> Just say, this is what it means. To occupy is to reveal another relationality. When talking of these important figures in 20th century art, um, Deleuze used the word to occupy, and he defined it as such. He says, when talking of uh, Pierre Boulez, a uh, French uh, conductor, still alive, I mean, the guy is incredibly old right now, but still there. Um, Pierre Boulez was very much interested in Marcel Proust. Marcel Proust is a writer, Pierre Boulez is a conductor, a musician, composer. What did Pierre Boulez do with Marcel Proust? Uh, when you ask Pierre Boulez, and you can do that because he's still alive, he will always say that Marcel Proust was his most important influence. There's a kind of musicality in Marcel Proust. I don't know if you've read uh, A la recherche du temps perdu. You shoot, it takes you the whole summer. It's, uh, <laughs> seven books like this. And it goes incredibly slow. The first book is when he visited his family house in a French village, very aristocratic. And he made him uh, stroll every Sunday to the left. And then there's the second book, which is on something else, on the neighbor actually. And then there's the third book, which is on how he went to the family house and made a stroll to the right. <laughs> Seven books. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, it's a bit Virginia Woolf. She read Russell Post and she said, well, there's nothing left to write. And mm -hmm. she didn't write for quite some time because it was just too overwhelming. The kind of details that are in the parish as we talked about. One walk is like, he writes about every leaf on every tree. And then it drops. Can you imagine what happens? <laughs> but it's beautiful, it's beautiful. What, did he, what does he do with language? Yeah, something very spectacular. But in the end, he also does something which, at least for Pierre Boulez, would be kind of musical. There's a kind of music in it. And this is the thing that Pierre Boulez picked up, or he occupied it. But how did he occupy it? What well, Deleuze says, he occupied it by heart, by will, and by chance. 
I think it's a very important definition of occupation. What would occupation mean by art, by will, and by chance? So it's not that Pierre Boulez copied Marcel Proust or kind of turned his words into music or whatever. He was just so fond of it, so taken by it, that he knew it by heart, by will, and by chance. It just had to be the most important influence in his life. And for his idea, his idea of creating art, it was only in this occupation of Proust, in finding new events, in searching for new accidents, in allowing new accidents to happen, that Pierre Boulez, I don't know if you know him, but he's really one of the most influential composers in 20th century music. Only because of his rereading of Proust. Pierre Boulez would say. And how can you how can you recognize this? Or when you listen to to Boulez, do you hear Proust? Well, in a way you can, I guess. You can hear him struggling with the concept of time, for instance. Pierre of uh, Massa Proust. So he wrote these seven books, and they are called A la recherche du à la recherche du temps perdu, in search for lost time. And I guess this is also what Pierre Boulez in the end is interested in, to be in search for a new type of time, a new type of history. You can write books about it, don't do it because many people have already done that. But I think it's a very interesting idea of how art works. Not so much something springs from the artist, but it is in the relation between all these words and concepts by Massa Proust. That's really the world that Pierre Boulez is interested in. He knows it by heart, by will, and by chance. He travels the world of Massa Proust, and then he gives rise to something else. The accident happens in the book, in A la recherche du temps perdu. That's the birth of Pierre Boulez as a conductor, as a musician, as a composer. So, coming back to a uh, uh, friend Bateson, who talks about uh, felling a tree. Uh, that's a kind of reality that we're used to, probably. Yeah. You have a tree, you have an axe, you have muscles, you have eyes, you have a mind, or a brain, sorry, a brain. And it's in between all of these things that an idea occurs, that thinking happens. But this time, sorry, yeah? Is it possible to make a comment or not? Make yeah, comment? yes, it's always possible to make comments. <laughs> Sorry, my ears are very bad, so... Oh, yeah, there is a good buzz going on. Yeah, I have it's a, I terrible. Have something, um, I arrived a little late, so perhaps I didn't really get the entire argument. Yeah, I said something very important. Yeah. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> um, I somehow said that you want to make the point that art is already there, and it's not something that, that pops out of the mind of an artist, but I do find it kind of strange that there are still words like the accident, the revelation, the moment, the unforeseen, it's still like the myth mystifies art using these kinds of concepts or words. I don't know if it's complicated. Why do you pick this word? <laughs> because I'm a philosopher. I'm allowed yeah, to pick this. I find it like a little bit contradicting. No, I'm not saying that art is already there. I would say that art, and this really is something that I started with, but I'm ready, I'm more than happy to repeat it. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no. Uh, because it's an important thing. So. Yeah. And repeat this often enough. Let's try to understand how art works. So art is not something already there. So art is something which is uh, at work. Mm -hmm. And we can play a role in it. So I'm trying to understand how art is at work and how we can play <coughs> it. And I also said that 
I'm a bit hesitant to use the word art. Mm -hmm. Myself, I prefer to use the creative act, mm -hmm. which is a bit more general, but also much more active. Mm -hmm. That is into an activity. Mm -hmm. And we can play a role in it. How can we play a role in it? Mm -hmm. To occupy something, to immerse mm -hmm. into the work of Marcel Proust, mm -hmm. to feel the kind of uh, art at work, to feel an accident and to create something new. The problem is that I started by saying that I'm not a phenomenologist, so this means that I will not consider someone an artist, mm -hmm. I will not consider something an artwork, mm -hmm. I will not accept the existence of art as kind of a container concept mm -hmm. which has things in it. Mm -hmm. I am interested in art as an activity. Uh, as something at work and I'm interested in how we can play a role in it how we can take part mm -hmm. how we in the end can create something in which something happens something which uh, you call a block of sensation I think Blocks of block of sensation, blocks of duration, a uh, thing in which an accident is at work. I think very important artworks that have been made a long time ago. Uh, some of them don't work. Uh, some of them still work and have an enormous amount of activity in them. Uh, and that has to do with their, in some way, still able to practice an accident to intervene the work of Caravaggio still has the power to intervene if you look at it it's still like something's happening So, but feel free to interrupt. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 that's good. Um, we talked about Boulez, we talked about Marcel Proust. There are many um, great names, of course, in 20th century art. And I think, uh, I said, I think the concept of occupation is very valuable. And you see it with all these artists, they kind of immerse in in the work of others or in particular situations in order to allow the accident to take place. Another famous example of how one artist occupies the work of another artist is, is linked to Samuel Beckett, what we talked about before, 
is a composer, Martin, Martin Feldman. And I like these examples, especially because they, uh, because they don't use the same material, right? Uh, we talked about um, uh, Boulez and Proust, uh, a writer and composer. And again, we're now talking about another writer and composer. So it's not linked to any kind of idea of an artwork in the end. It's not that there's a difference in the end between uh, writing a book and making a film and writing a musical score. What matters is the creative act. And what we have to search for is to find ways to be a part of that, to cling in. And I think these people have been very good at that. Others also think that they were very good at that. It's uh, for us to find out how they did it. I think it works through occupation. Morton Feldman occupies Samuel Beckett. I don't know if you're familiar with the work of Samuel Beckett. You should also read Samuel Beckett, which is also taking you another summer, by the way, which will, make you, which will drive you completely crazy. The work of Samuel Beckett is very interesting. Um, the Leuze would call it because what Samuel Beckett is trying to do is he's trying to exhaust language. Nothing is possible anymore. Sounds like a very negative thing to do, but in the end, it's a very noble and ethical movement, uh, I guess. I think Samuel Beckett has been crucial for the development of 20th century poetry, language, also film. He made some beautiful films, also for television, by the way. You have to analyze these dialogues. They're fantastic. But what he does, time and again, is to exhaust language. Kind of. Nothing is possible anymore at the end of Beckett. And this is really Samuel Beckett and Morton Feldman. Morton Feldman, again, another uh, uh, important 20th century composer. Morton Feldman is also interested in kind of exhausting music. <coughs> exhausting the idea of sound, of any sonic occurrence. And actually, you've been listening to uh, work of Morton Feldman, which is supposed to be played at the back. It is not supposed to be kind of in front of everything. It is supposed to intervene. What does Morton Feldman do? He makes music, which is supposed to be very soft, very subtle. The, this composition is called Crippled Symmetry. What he's trying to do is to exhaust any kind of melody, harmony, rhythm, anything that has to do with our idea of how music works has to go. And that's the excellent that has to happen. Similar to how Beckett is interested in I don't know if you're familiar with the work of Samuel Beckett, I guess so. Or Samuel Beckett is interested in kind of getting rid of the whole idea of language in the end. The whole idea of a dialogue. It's very confronting. Very good. So to exhaust Sorry. Uh, I would say that most of his work still comprises a dialogue within his mind, within himself. The work of Samuel Beckett? Yeah. Uh, uh, yes, at least it starts as a dialogue. Uh, but in the end, the whole idea of the dialogue being that there will be a conversation between two people, mm -hmm. that they exchange information, that it works towards something, uh, that it is about setting up a plan to uh, intervene in the world, that will never happen with Samuel Beckett. Same way with, uh, with if you read Kafka, uh, also nothing will happen. 
they will never reach the castle. And we know that. that we can read for 500 pages. It's not like a typical story of conflict resolution. Sorry? It's not like the typical story of a conflict and then having a resolution in the end. That's yeah. Right. And that is really what an occupation is about. And that is really what an artwork is about. That in the end, you kind of map these relations and you intervene. A conversation does not have to take place. Uh, there does not have to be a solution. And that's kind of the shocking thing about art. That all of these ideas that we have, these very Call it logic. The whole idea of logic, in the end, is kind of, well, not so much wiped out, but it's taken into a different direction. And that is also why Francis Bacon talks of the accident. The accident has to happen. What is what happens when an accident happens? Everything that was supposed to happen goes wrong, and it's a shock. A shock to thought. That's Brian Masumi would call it. It's a shock to thought. It makes you think, what has happened? But that is precisely what the creative act, or an artwork, is in the end about. I would say. And I would call this an activist philosophy or an activist idea of art. Activism is then not necessarily linked to May 68 or uh, 1789. It would be uh, to be interested in the creative acts and to be interested in how to intervene in terms of a creative act. But that also means that art is necessarily a kind of shock to fall, a kind of accident. So why is this activist activist need what, what sorry, why this activist need to reveal another or a holy other world through the arts? I introduced this idea of, uh, to practice a, some kind of an occupation. Well, first, the Occupy is not about... Uh, I don't like sitting here. First, the Occupy is not about critiquing that which is being occupied. Do, is it... Uh, n n n should we have breaks or something? Is that uh, it's just one and a half hour? Um, to occupy is not about critiquing that which is being occupied. Remember that someone like Pierre Boulez was not critiquing Marcel Proust at all. I don't think that uh, Francis Bacon was critiquing pop art or magazine journal or journals or paint at all. But rather about fully affirming it. To love something by heart, by will and by chance. It means a complete immersion in a situation, in a book, in another artwork, in an event. So occupying is not about critique. Second, it is not something which is occupied, but one is occupied by something. One does not have an idea on something, which would gain to be a, ca a Kantian solution. I'm not going to talk about Immanuel Kant, but okay. Occupation rather comes with an intense love, with a desire to explore a new landscape. The desire to explore means you start with Marcel Proust and you 
uh, finished the first book on uh, La Côte de Chez Soin, the stroll to the left, and you think, I have to continue this. This is, there's something going on here. I have to read all of these seven books. And again and again. So this immersion, this kind of being caught up in something. A fresh wind in the back. You have to kind of go along, you have to continue reading it, you have to continue listening to Morton Feldman, whatever. I think that's the only thing, in the, uh, the, the only way in the end to understand anything about art. Complete immersion. Being a part of it, being soaked up in it. And then opening up to some kind of accident or some kind of thing to happen. Something has to happen. So coming back to my uh, initial uh, statement, <coughs> which was uh, like uh, trying to understand how art works and how it can play a role in it. I think it's crucial that uh, uh, when I talk about art, when I talk about how art comes to be, uh, I don't think that the artist plays, or that the human being, plays a crucial role in it. I think art is out there, at work, and it is our we have to do it out of love. Uh, and it is our uh, task or our desire, we have a very strong desire, to be a part of that. Cling in. But in the end, that is not a human thing. I think that art, in the end, can happen, always can happen everywhere. And this is, uh, okay, the, yeah, this was the moment where I did bring in Deleuze, because this is a quote from uh, uh, What is Philosophy, where they talk about a bird. Uh, they say that art does not wait, this is, sorry about the <laughs> terrible mix-up things. Um, First they say that art does not wait for the human being to begin. It would be kind of arrogant also to think that it's kind of us doing that. Oh, we have wonderful things in the world and we are responsible for that. Only us. Now it doesn't wait for the human being to begin. It's territorial. It means it's kind of it has to do with the situation. With the kind of exploration of a space, of a new space which has to be occupied. The space can also be a book, by the way. It's also a space. And it gives rise to another world. Now this example is always interesting because it shows how art happens everywhere, where the moment of art is at work. So I'm going to read it out, including the Latin name of the word. Every morning, the Sene Poetis Denti rostris, a bird of the Australian rainforest, cuts leaves, makes them fall to the ground, and turns them over so that the paler internal side contrasts with the earth. In this way, it constructs a stage for itself, like a ready made. And directly above, on a keeper or a bench, or a branch, while fluffing out the feathers beneath its beak to reveal their yellow roots, it sings a complex song made from its own notes and at intervals those of other birds that, imit that it imitates. It is a complete artist. And on the back, by the way, you see the birds turning these leaves. And that's, that's the stage where the performance takes place. Now why is this interesting for the Deleuze Guattari? Because it shows 
well, first of all, that there's no human being involved in any way. But there is the creative act at work. And what is also interesting is that this creative act takes place in relation to many other aspects of the environment. It reminds me a lot about uh, the quote that I started with. Uh, Gregory Bateson. Tree, eyes, brain, muscles, X, stroke, tree. There's a kind of thinking at work. It's not too different from what the bird is involved in. So it's really about rethinking, rethinking things ecologically. about occupying something that you love dearly it allows you to uh, to reveal another world are you still with me? yeah I wonder if and, and this might be like too practical of a question mm -hmm. um, because this is very ph philosophical, but I am wondering what, in this idea that art happens in relation always to something else, whether and it doesn't have to be a human in relation to something else, but what happens with intent or intention? And I'm specifically speaking of as, as an artist who makes something with yeah. intent. I think there's a very difficult concept, intent. Because that, had, that comes with the idea that you, as an artist, think of something and then you make your important artwork. Whereas I think that art happens in a different way. I think that art happens very much in a sort of struggle. You do something that you like, mm -hmm. that you love dearly. You're making films, or whatever. But it's not art from the first moment at all. It is a long struggle painful and often it goes wrong and it's actually you waiting for something to happen and sometimes it happens often it doesn't happen and then you're very frustrated and you think I'm making only rubbish yeah. but there's this only there's this moment where it can happen and that's what you're waiting for you're not in control it's not you saying okay now the artwork will occur the accident has to happen. You have to open up in a way to the outer world, to the particular, to, to, to the situation that you're in, the kind of angles that are possible. Coming to you in a minute. Uh, uh, so you have to immerse. And when you're filming something, you have to immerse in a situation. You have to feel everything. You have to have done this many times before, of course. You have to know what, how the camera works, what it, uh, what it but you also have to rediscover the camera. But you have to open up for an accident to occur. You have to open up for an idea to emerge, and then all of a sudden, it's there. And would you say that the real, sorry, would you say that that's the same for collaboration? To so say you're collaborating. It's always a collaboration. This is uh, uh, sorry, I have to uh, go back again. Uh, this is also a collaboration that uh, uh, that Bateson talks of. These are all active forces. The tree is an active force. Which means that you it's it's not as if you can learn to fell a tree and then you do it and you don't have to think with it, it's just it's going to happen. It's not. It's resisting. All the forces are always resisting because they have no agenda or an idea. And that's why I keep stressing that you are not in control. The artist is not in control. That there's, I think the word artist is a very tricky one. The creative act can happen. It can take place. And it is us who have to, in some way, be open to it. 
And I guess what an artist has to learn is to be open to it. To see the new angles, to see the sun in a different way. Sorry, you will wait for all of that. Would you call them the whole process of creation and art? The whole, would I call the whole process of creation an art? No, I would. Uh, I said I'm not that fond of the word art in that sense. I think uh, you could you could call it a creative process, although it might not be creative at all. It might be long-lasting and tiring and frustrating. I mean, what is creative? What is creative? Creative is uh, to be open to this process. And I think that is very important for artists, also for philosophers, by the way, who also have to be creative. Yeah. Does that like lose anything to be an art as well? If you Sorry? Because then anything could also be an art if you look at it that way. Anything? Yeah, like anything that requires those processes of well, the accident mm -hmm. and then um, well, also putting your heart and chance and well, what else was there? <laughs> well, I use a lot of words. Yes. Uh, will in it? I mean, being a philosopher as well? Or That's why I use the word creative. But do you think that this uh, bird is a complete artist? Picking up complex, uh, the complex song made with its own notes, and it involves uh, those of other birds that it imitates. It's really kind of a very ecological uh, mm -hmm. uh, idea. But, but is, is there any, any uh, maybe to make it sort of more concrete, is there any purpose of it? Does he know what, what happens next? Does the bird. Do we know what happens next? No, no not always, but we might uh, intend to having a creative act to uh, to have an influence on something yeah. or, to, or to react on something that's there. Yeah. Does, does, does the bird uh, intend to create something that can be reflected on? I said I have problems with the concept of intention. Because yeah, I, I think any kind of intention <laughs> has nothing to do with art in the end. Mm -hmm. uh, art is a break away from something. Uh, art is the moment where the unforeseen is realized. Art is the moment where something happens, an accident, whatever. Yeah? Well, we talk about unforeseen, but I wonder if it's about responsibility, in this sense. Responsibility. Yeah. I think uh, when I say that uh, uh, Samuel Beckett exhausts language, you can say, well, that's not very responsible at all, come on. 
you're a writer, you should not exhaust language. I think it's a very ethical and political practice uh, that he stands for. And why? Uh, because he shows us uh, another world. And the fact that language is a construction, the fact that the whole idea of a conversation is a construction, that there is a very positivist idea about a conversation that it always has to lead to something. Why does it have to lead to something? Why can't we just talk? Why do we have to be two people when we talk? Why does it have to be kind of exchange? Why do we need information when we are talking? So, so having an intention is a misconception of ourselves and within I think that uh, uh, when we talk about art, uh, we should not be interested in intention at all. We should, we, we should never try to do. We should never try to have a creative act happening. Well, you can't. You can open yourselves up mm -hmm. to an environment, but it's not that you take your camera and you go out and you think, okay. And now I'm going to make a very... It's like a, a, the, the whole idea that it would be a recipe for a, uh, for a huge uh, hit. Uh, yeah, but so sometimes the art happens after, of course. Like yeah. it, it happens... You could intend to do something like that without, with or without an intention, but maybe that's what calling it intention. But when people react upon it, that's where, yeah. where it is created then. Yeah, but if you talk about uh, Duchamp, uh, the ready maids put it in a different environment and all of a sudden something happens. Or not. Mm -hmm. I don't know what it is. You were also, sorry, in the uh, trying to keep track yeah, of things. Yeah, that was it. I'm just wondering if there is then what about political art? Um, political art? Yeah, such as the art of uh, the 1920s. Mm -hmm. Um, I think pretty, pretty all of my examples come from the 1920s, by the way. Okay. Um, but then, I, I'm just more curious because it really has this first showing how the Soviet Union is a strong nation built from um, labor. Mm -hmm. um, and, and depicting it, how all those paintings and all those um, artists just showing about how. Would you call that art? No, 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 it's because would you call it art? Because it's lost me to my question. Propaganda, I would say, it has yeah. to do with art. Uh, it can happen. Sometimes it's beautiful in a strange way, or it's kind of. Uh, yeah, it, it can still do something. But perhaps not the way it was intended. Mm. No. Which is very yeah. important here, of yeah. course. Yeah. No intention. Yeah. But this is a, is this a audience? Yeah. I wonder like, if, where's the viewer? Where's the audience? Yeah. It's a good question. It has to do with my first statement. The fact that I'm not a phenomenologist. So I don't make a difference between an artist, an artwork, and art. I don't make a difference between an artist and an audience too. Yeah, but you can make the role viewing them, like some of the artists can be viewing them. It, does make, does it make always them. does that. that that's, where, that's the way Francis Bacon paints his paintings. He puts something on it and he has to step back and he has to be a, a, a viewer or a spectator. And then he thinks that something has to happen, something new has to come in. So it's the process that's what finds it. I think that the viewer uh, plays an important role in the process. Viewing itself, and that's like what one's the end. I wouldn't say that there's a strict difference between the artist and the viewer in that sense. And I mean, that happens in contemporary theater very much so. But um, I mean, who's the creator of the artwork? And we should try to be a part of it somehow. No. I was still thinking about the intention. Um, isn't doesn't intention play a role simply in this willingness to open yourself up? I mean, of course, yeah. it's not only intent as in rational intent, also the desire, also that you, you cannot not do this. But 
but partly also they intend to, to, to keep doing that, to keep putting the effort uh, out of love, but also, I mean, intent also comes out of that love. Yeah. Yes, I think you could say that. Um, although, I'm not thinking of um, uh, someone like Ai Weiwei, like the Chinese activist artist, who always says that, uh, that he's actually not really an activist in, in the traditional sense of the word, because he's not searching for ways to kind of provoke or to uh, change the system. It's just that he's interested in something. He's very much fascinated by whatever is going on. Uh, for instance, if we talk about the sunflower seeds, he would be interested in the whole production process uh, as it takes place <coughs> in the south of China. And the whole Pearl River Delta you know, from Hong Kong to uh, uh, Guangdong is one big production area where Made in China comes from. And um, so he was interested in that production process and he kind of occupied, he loved it a lot. He loved sunflower seeds. He loved uh, uh, handwork. So he made uh, four villages paint sunflower seeds for a year long. What is the moment of activism? What is the moment of resistance? It comes with it, I would say. It is not that he thought, oh, let's challenge the whole idea of capitalism and let's just not sell this stuff, but just throw it on the floor and that's it. It's, um, I think it's a very nice example of how to occupy um, a process, situation, and yeah, jumps in, someone's interfering. Uh, and he makes us think about many different things, not so much intended. But it's something that he, everyone who visited the Tate uh, Modern and, and saw all these sunflower seeds was kind of, what's going on here? Something is going on here. An accident has happened, and it's still happening in some way, but I don't know what it is. So many different responses on it. sense of course to say that there's an artist sorry I don't have too much space You have to create artworks. No, 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 no. I'm saying that if you do things, if we act in life, and, yeah. and how we do that uh, depends on previous uh, experiences, and that affects how you yeah. uh, act upon. I would say that I'm if you think about it in the creative. Yeah, I think that if you follow that path, mm -hmm. there will never be something like art. Okay. Yeah, good. There has to be a break. There has to be a moment where something intervenes. Isn't that just one way of looking upon art? Is that the definition of art? That's the definition that I want to talk about. Okay. <laughs> you can come up with other definitions, no, no, but I would say that that is not art. Okay. 
I would say that art is always in need of a kind of intervention. Yeah. And that we, that we as artists should be open to that kind of intervention. And I think that this is what you as artists are always doing. You are trying to open up. You are always experimental. You are not going out and thinking, okay, I have to make this film. Oh, I do this. No. You stand there and you see what's going on. And you try to find some kind of response. And it doesn't work. And you get frustrated. And you think, oh, there was a bad idea. It wasn't a bad idea at all. You try something else. You use that in using trying something else, isn't it? Yeah, but that is not the intention. No, but it is. It's affecting how you act. So it's not the intention that I'm now making art. But previous experiences, I do think, affect because you try something and it failed. So I understand that you have had previous experiences and that you bring them along. Yeah, and it some in some way has work. The, the the guy uh, cutting down the tree has probably done before, but still, in order for thinking to take place, mm -hmm. there always has to be new information and it's or, or a new kind of development, and it always works like that because there are all these active mm -hmm. powers which, in some way, will always surprise you. But, but, it, but it can come from a memory. This accident. For example, and then it's linked what you're saying. So it's coming from your, uh, your kind of your other experience, and you are in front of this situation, and then maybe memory bumps up, and then it's the accident could be there from a memory. Accident. The interesting thing about an accident is that it always happens accidentally, yeah. and that you don't know how it happened, but all of a sudden it's there, and there's a completely new situation. Exactly. But it all the same ingredients, but it's mixed up, and it's unrecognizable. But it, but it can come, for example, you smell something, then suddenly a memory comes, and then you have the accident. Like so Marcel Proust, he smelled. Yeah, exactly. Actually, he rolls an apple, but he says he smells uh, uh, Madeleine, and then his entire childhood comes back to him. But and this is linked to your previous experiences, your previous memories, uh, which at the same time, but not like as an intent. Yeah, but memory. If, now we're talking about other things. Memory is not a kind of a. Uh, a library of ideas. Yeah, Memory is realized in a different way time and again. Don't think that you've had one life up until now and that life will come back time and again. It will change depending on the situation that you're in. Sorry, you were first, I guess? Your yeah. neighbor? I don't know. Yeah. It's a bit of a... Just, ju just break. So, okay, so then there's a, my question is like artist, but I'm a scholar. Yeah. And I can basically I could replace the word artist and scholar in the whole story that wouldn't change in your mouth. Only thing is that practically that's very not good, but then for me that, that's very good. I mean, it's like if you want to exhaust a budget or is the public by a hard time, you will have a chance. Mm -hmm. That's the way but in which some people lose, yeah. Well, but then, well, how do you position science? Science? Yeah, or, yeah, scholarship. Well, you can make a very strict distinction between science, philosophy, and art, but in the end, these are all mixed, of course. There has to be an idea, there has to be a creative act, uh, also in the laboratories. Uh, so, I don't see a strict uh, definition of science. Would be useful. For example, for me, would be really if I would think this is true like this, but then it's like perfectly like I would be judged by very specific rules on saying. Well, it, as an as a scientist. As a scholar, yeah. Yeah. If you succeed or not. Yeah, that's the the hard thing about life, being judged. <laughs> yeah, but that's the viewer, right? So then, then, then the viewer is important. Mm -hmm. But that is not what I'm talking about. I'm only interested in how art works. Uh, and uh, of course there are other mechanisms at work, but kind of, yeah, that's too bad, actually. But I have a response to this, actually, because isn't it that you can also see <coughs> scholarship as a particular, um, let's say, medium, as a 
as an artist, also, if you, if you choose the medium of language, for instance, of writing, um, you, you need to master certain rules of that language. You need to know, basically, what words mean and how to put words together. You know, you, you need to work with that medium. So if you know it by heart, by will and by chance, exactly. you have to read the entire proofs. Exactly. You, you need to sort of, you, of course, you need to master that meaning. Yeah, and that's I agree. The, the, the thing. Actually, I wanted to, to connect to your previous question about the responsibility of the it is, for me, this kind of this ecological thinking has a lot of responsibility in it because you need to, as in responsibility, the ability to respond, you need to respond to the to all these elements that are around you, to the environment, to, mm. to, to memories, to what you see, you need to react to, but not react, really respond. And that where responsibility comes in, that you need to think of how do you capture it, how do you uh, you know, what do you do with this, what you see? So, I thought that for me, that, that's where it's possible. Yeah, very good. And, um, do you have a short remark? Uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. Yeah, right. um, yeah, I was wondering, it, it seems somewhat that you, uh, in my words, you seem to diminish art as a creative act, like it, it mm -hmm. means, yeah, you seem to diminish art as a creative act, like yeah, I'm not demanding diminish, but it, 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 it becomes more of a, a as you say, in ecology. Uh, sorry, I mean, diminish was the wrong word, but you're using the other word. Practice. Yeah, as an active practice. So, in that, that way, you could say a, a good artist, they're open for this ecology, ecolo but they actually hear, like, at what point would you say if an artist is doing a good job or is he doing something good? Because, in a way, you could say he, is accidental making good work or work that is seen as good work and where does his uh, and, and you as a person you say this is a good you like France, you like how it works but how, how it comes to you you like the medium, how we translate it yeah. stuff or how things are translated because where is he in this where is he as a maker um, yeah, well I said I'm not so much interested in an artist, I am not so much interested in defining a good artist in relation to a bad artist. Uh, I would be interested in whether it works for me. Um, the work of Marcel Proust works for many people. Mm -hmm. uh, the work of Samuel Beckett works for many people. Mm -hmm. But it is it then accidentally made, accidentally made by Proust? Yeah, the way you use the word accident now. Yeah, I know it's different. Yeah. It's, uh, I'm not trying to use the same accidents as yeah. it. <laughs> As if it's just an accident. But the accident is very difficult. But it happened to be him. Yeah, okay. If, like, uh, for example, if he wasn't born with, with the... Oh, uh, it just still would still exist. Where, where did um, the art begin? Or where... Uh, if it's in... What was the first art if it's always response and at some point it looks like a, uh, a reproducing? Uh, I just, I'll stick with my first question. <laughs> 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 you want to respond? Yes, please.
a sort of just regular consumer, you might just, it might be enough for you to know how to click the button, how to stop it, and how to transfer it to the computer. But as an artist, you, you try to see also what kind of image it creates, what are the angles at which you can film, and uh, what does that produce. I mean, I think that technical skills are, they're not just technical skills, they do something to the, to the content, to the story that you're trying mm -hmm. to But the lack of technical skills do yeah. that as well. Yes, it can, but... Um, but you can, you can be very technical and make bad art or bad, like, mm -hmm. things that don't work. Yes, yeah, certainly, and that's why only technical skills are not yeah. enough, but it's mm -hmm. about creating a, a, you know, let's say, an environment or a likelihood for this to happen. Yeah, but Can I make two final remarks? Yeah. Because then you continue the conversation. <laughs> uh, I think that there's also one more question. Yeah. Uh, you see, there, there's a question about the Rosenberg yeah. right? Yeah. Okay. You know it's from the Rosenberg yeah. right? <laughs> um, because I think this is a nice, uh, you know, some, some sort of conclusion. To dismantle the most resilient powers that have been structuring the earth for so long, and more importantly, in such a bad way, requires all of the resources of art and art of the highest kind. That is their definition of art in the end. And this, this is really about occupation, about resistance, and also about responsibility. Definitely. The ability to respond to those most resilient powers that have been structuring Europe for so long. That's a very activist philosophy in the end. And it's a great position of art, uh, very crucial. This is what art can do. Only art can do. So it's quite a task that you have ahead of you. <laughs> in this project. Why did you choose the picture? This picture, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, you don't see it really well, but this was a um, project that I was involved in, how art can save the world. It was uh, an exhibition in The Hague, the uh, Gemeente uh, Museum. And then there were all these artists who kind of made statements about the state of the world today. And this was just a, uh, Prepared wolf, but it looks really angry and down upon us. So I think it's a minor. Uh, it, it, it's only. Uh, it's, it's a minor accident, but still, it's very interesting, uh, very telling of how something different takes place here. It's not just a, a, a wolf anymore. All of a sudden, it has a lot to say. It has a lot to say about how we have treated it, or uh, how we treat the world, or... Uh, so I like to... I like the... The way it looks down upon us. What are you doing? Yeah, but it's not... It's, really, it's, a, it's, a, it's actually really strong eyes. You can see a bit over here. There are the wolf. <coughs> Um, yeah, I was. I had the idea of coming with this as a final example, but we co we talk a lot about other examples, so that's fine. It's maybe just a thought to uh, for lunch to, to chew upon. This is one of those projects that I think is very interesting about revealing another world. A choir made of muscles. Uh, it's there. They make sounds, um, and we can inter interact with them. Uh, and it's not uh, very intentional in the sense that this has a very, uh, uh, very clear idea of what we should do with it, or and this is a new statement about the world. It just shows you something that's already going on, but that we just have never realized before, or that has never been opened up to us, or that it's just never occurred as something important. So I like these contemporary bio arts, people like Natalie Yeremienko. It's, uh, it's 
story of how to that's life. Um, I like their work because they're really trying to interfere in some way. They are interested in, uh, like the bird perhaps, or like the man felling the tree, uh, bringing up another idea, showing something which is going on with which we uh, never guessed would have happened. So. so what's your role as an academic when you work in projects with artists? My role as an academic? Yeah. It sounds like a very moral thing. <laughs> no, what do you do? You represent university, you No, no it's, it's yeah. honestly like, what do you do? What do I do? Yeah, when you work together with artists, what's your role? I would not so much consider myself an academic, more a philosopher. And my role would be, or I would be very much interested in the idea that it creates. Uh, I work a lot with artists. And uh, making film now also. It'll take a long time but, uh, to see how ideas uh, emerge. And an e idea is not something which is limited to a book. Uh, something that it can, it, it happens in films, it happens in well, artworks, I want to say in that sense. So I'm just wrong with the. Uh, Occupied by it, but you interfere in the in the work of the artist. Expert. If I work with, with an artist, <laughs> yeah. If, I, if you work with an artist, how you know your role? I you know understand your position. I hope I'm just being one of the one of the the things in this chain, mm -hmm. kind of uh, kind of involved in the act, involved in the creative act, and. Well, I said I don't like the concept of an artist. Perhaps I don't like the concept of a philosopher in it as well. I just like things to come together and to be open to anything that can happen. And then and you open up conversations, for example. Me. Your the, role. The, when I when yeah. I am with an in, artist. In this chain, in this or in this. Uh, you well, open yeah, up you conversation. talk. You experience. You. To try to search for things that you weren't ready yet. Yeah, yeah, how do you do that? How do you do it as a filmmaker? Yeah. You, you look through your camera and you think, this is it. No, this is, the light is wrong, or the camera is wrong. And, uh, yeah, it's, a, it's a very experimental process. So that's what you are then caught up in, in this experimental process that hopefully will be creative in a way. But often it won't. And sometimes there is this idea. I like the idea moment, of course. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, I don't know if this was a conclusion, but. <laughs>